I thank very much all um, today's speakers and thanks to everyone for joining. My name is Ronan Palmer. I'm Clean Economy uh, Director at E3G, uh, Climate Think Tank. Um, this is another seminar, in, a virtual seminar, as these now will have to be, in our Inspire series. That's uh, Inspire, that's the, the International Network for Sustainable Financial Policy Insights, Research and Exchange. You can see why the acronym Inspire is preferred. Um, we're really pleased that we're organizing this together with our friends at the SOAS Center for Sustainable Finance. Uh, with CSEN and the Bennett Institute for Public Policy. Um, uh, it, we're going to, to start today with a, a series of short presentations by our speakers and I'll introduce each one of those as, as they're coming up. But just a, a very quick overview between June, starting June last month and October this year, we're taking a look at what central banks and finance ministers across the world can do so that we can respond to the current economic crisis, but respond to it in a way that's consistent with our commitments to environmental and sustainability goals. So today we're thinking how monetary and financial policy can support the environmental and sustainability goals. We think uh, very much today in terms of Europe, we're thinking how we get through the recovery period, but we're also thinking how are we setting ourselves up for the long term? Obviously, the recovery is a huge issue for us all at the moment. Uh, I think it's really important, though, that we we bear in mind that we are not recovering into nothing in a sense. We're recovering into a world that's already well committed. Many parts of the world are well committed to uh, moving to net zero. Uh, to improving the sustainability of our economies and I think that that in a sense that that is a a commitment that goes through the whole of the economy what we and our friends at SOAS and, and others have been very keen to do through this series is show just how that feeds into the roles of monetary and fiscal policy makers around the world and so I'm really pleased to be uh, chairing today's event as I say, we have some speakers. We have a uh, an online Q and A function. Please do add any questions you may have to that Q and A function. We'll pick them up after the speaker's finished, uh, and there will be a chance to 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 he uh, hear your reflections as a as a attendees and the speaker's responses to what's coming back. So, without any further ado, I would like to start off today's session and I'm going to turn first to Isabel, Isabel Schnabel, the Executive Board of the European Central Bank. Uh, Isabel, I'd like to pass over to you. Uh, my colleague Arthur from E3G is going to make sure that we can see slides that any of the presenters have during the day, uh, during the morning. So thank you very much, Isabel. Good morning uh, everybody. Uh, it's a great pleasure to uh, to be here today. So let's wait for the slides. Perfect. I hope you can all see them well, right? So I'm going to talk about the relationship of the current COVID crisis, climate change and monetary policy. And as uh, we all know, the uh, coronavirus pandemic uh, constitutes an unprecedented shock. And maybe you can move to my first slide. So the lockdown has led to the temporary closing down of many production sites. Global air and road travel have come to a virtual standstill. And as a result, the total uh, carbon dioxide emissions in 2020 uh, will be about four to 7% lower than estimated before the crisis. So in, uh, if you look at the graphs, you can see that in the past 120 years, there has never been an event that had such a dramatic impact in, on global CO2 emissions. Yet, studies show that even this sharp drop would not be sufficient to limit the global temperature increase to the 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels as aspired under the Paris Agreement. Uh, and so in order to meet that goal, according to the United Nations, global uh, emissions uh, actually would need to drop by 7.6% each year between 2020 and 2030. 
And so the pandemic is a stark reminder that preventing climate change requires a fundamental structural change to our economy. With a brutal clarity, the current crisis has exposed the far-reaching damages imposed on our society by a lack of prevention and by a lack of early action fostered by disbelief in science in the face of a global shock that threatens not only the economy, but our lives. And it has shown the repercussions of the failure to act collectively in a globalized world, hitting the poorest and the most vulnerable most severely. By making the costs of a major, truly global crisis more tangible, the pandemic may actually help to remove the tragedy from Makani's horizon. So after COVID-19, the dramatic consequences of a global climate crisis may be much easier to imagine. And in my remarks this morning, I will argue that three complementary pillars are needed in order to accelerate the transition towards a low carbon economy. An effective carbon price, a strong investment program, and a greener financial market. I will also argue that central banks have a role to play in mitigating climate-related risks, even within their traditional mandates. And so let's please move to the next slide. And I will start with the first pillar, which is the introduction of global carbon pricing. So Europe is already spearheading global efforts. The EU's emission trading system, the ETS, is the world's largest carbon market. Its cap and trade uh, scheme provides a mechanism for both reducing the total amount of emissions in a cost-efficient way and for ensuring that pollution is priced adequately. However, there's no reason for complacency. The uh, current ETS only covers economic sectors that together account for less than one half of total carbon emissions in the EU. And a global solution at the moment is out of reach. Moreover, carbon prices is not a sufficient condition to manage the transition towards a more sustainable economy, which brings me to the second pillar. Strong public and private investment efforts are needed to prevent consumers from being locked into carbon intensive technologies. So for example, infrastructure investment, let's say for charging electric vehicles, uh, could trigger wide ranging changes in the type of energy mix used in public and private transport. So the costs of letting the current crisis go to waste would be exceptionally large. And please go to my next slide. So uh, first, the business dynamism in Europe has been comparatively weak for a long time, as is displayed in, uh, on this slide. And this is holding back productivity growth, as well as technology creation and diffusion. The COVID-19 pandemic is a unique opportunity to break this vicious circle. So the crisis has the potential to help accelerate the adoption and diffusion of green and sustainable technologies across large parts of the economy. Policymakers need to allow, facilitate and support this process. But there is a risk that some of the crisis measures they, that were introduced for good reasons may, if kept in place for too long, actually delay the necessary structural adjustments. And second, the crisis will cause a significant increase in the public and private debt burden. And the best way to avoid the risk of growing debt becoming a long lasting burden for society is actually to lift potential growth. And these are the reasons why the EU Innovation Fund and the EU Recovery Fund's focus on the green transition are so important. So let me now move to the, uh, to the third pillar and to my next slide. So uh, the third pillar needed uh, for the transition towards a low carbon economy relates to financial markets. The large increase in required bond issuance in response to the pandemic offers the opportunity to deepen the green financial market. Green bond issuance has steadily increased in recent years, as you can see on this slide. Please move to the next slide. But as you can also see, uh, on, on the, on the left-hand side is that the universe of green bonds remains vanishingly small compared with the total bond universe in spite of the exponential surge in investor demand for green assets shown on the right-hand side. Please go to the next slide. 
And um, the, this lack of market depth is also reflected in prices. So green bonds tend to be priced at a premium over uh, conventional bonds, which in part reflects the poorer liquidity conditions. So the current crisis could give an unparalleled boost to the green financial market and thereby help to reduce the costs of transitioning towards a low carbon economy. Uh, but I believe that market forces will not be sufficient to mobilize the funds required to finance this transition. Further policy actions are needed. So first, the costs of the crisis are mainly debt finance. But there's growing empirical evidence that suggests that stock markets are more effective than bond markets in financing the greening of our economy. And Europe, therefore, urgently needs to make, uh, to make faster progress towards creating a true capital markets union with a strong focus on equity markets. There's, by the way, also a geopolitical dimension. Financial market structures are gradually readjusting after the United Kingdom's exit from the EU, and green finance has the potential to tip the scale to one side or the other. Second, faster progress is needed on disclosure and standardization. So at the current juncture, there is a high degree of uncertainty about what actually qualifies as a green activity. And the adoption in mid-June of the European Commission's taxonomy regulation was an important step in establishing a classification system for sustainable economic activities. But the framework is expected to become fully operational only after uh, the adoption of its delegated act in 2021 and 2022. And so we'll provide only limited guidance uh, at this time when the issuance needs are reaching historical highs. Moreover, green taxonomy needs to be complemented by a taxonomy for environmental harmful activities. And please go to my next slide. And uh, third, the taxonomy requires granular data for it to be usable. And this is uh, clearly visible when looking at environmental ratings displayed on, on this slide for financial products. So as of today, um, the indicators from different sources often display a very low, albeit rising, correlation. Uh, the disclosure of climate-related information should therefore become mandatory and more standardized under the revised non-financial reporting directive. So what then, if any, could be the role of central banks and of monetary policy in particular in supporting the transition towards a low carbon economy. Climate change, if not addressed swiftly, can be expected to pose material risks to price stability in the medium to long term. So on the one hand, the longer the risks of global warming are ignored, the higher are the risks of very large and persistent shocks to output and inflation. On the other hand, the ability of central banks to react to such large shocks may be impaired. So rising temperatures and the increased frequency of natural disasters may further suppress potential output and hence the real equilibrium interest rate. And uh, for these reasons, central banks cannot just stand on the sideline when it comes to climate change. And the COVID-19 pandemic has actually taught us that monetary and fiscal policy are most effective when they are complementing each other. This will also be true in the fight against climate change. And I see three major avenues to which the ECB and um, central banks more generally can contribute. So the first is through our involvement in defining rules and standards. The ECB is a member of the Network for Greening the Financial System and has contributed actively to the development of the EU taxonomy. Such activities are at the same time instrumental for promoting capital markets union. The second way is by ensuring that we ourselves are environmentally responsible investors. So we are doing this already for our pension fund investments, and we are now exploring options for other non-monetary policy portfolios. The third and most controversial way uh, is by taking climate consideration into account when designing and implementing our monetary policy operations. Already now, as part of our purchase programs, and this uh, moves me to my next slide, uh, the euro system is buying eligible green bonds. We are currently holding around 20% of the eligible green corporate bond universe, as shown on the left-hand side. But the green universe, and this displayed on the right-hand side, only comprises a small fraction of the overall universe. But as, as this market segment grows and develops, the euro system will automatically purchase more green bonds. The more difficult question is whether the euro system should be more proactive and forceful in greening its asset purchases 
or in adjusting um, uh, its, uh, the conditions of uh, our re refinancing operations, including the collateral framework. And such questions will actually feature prominently in our upcoming monetary policy strategy review. And there are two, uh, two opposing views regarding the debate on greening asset purchases. So one view is that central banks would overstep their mandate if they were to discriminate among investors on the basis of considerations that fall into the realm of fiscal policy. So according to this view, market neutrality is the benchmark central banks should use when purchasing bonds issued by corporates. The other view is that central banks have to respond to market failures and have to incorporate the far-reaching risks that climate change poses to the price stability when designing their policy instruments. And importantly, this uh, second type of uh, line of um, um, argument is not about weighing secondary objectives. It is about protecting the primary objective. So let me conclude. The current crisis teaches us that decisive and early action is crucial to tackle global disruptions. It enables us to better imagine the much more dramatic consequences that society could face if we were to fail on our efforts to fight climate change. And while the pandemic can eventually and hopefully be cured, global warming is much harder to reverse, raising the costs of taking no action today. The COVID-19 pandemic provides a chance to build a greener economy. It is a chance to break the vicious circle of weakening entrepreneurship and the slow diffusion of new and green technologies that have held back productivity growth and prosperity in Europe for too long. And it is a chance to build a deeper and greener financial market that reduces the costs of transitioning towards a low carbon economy. The ECB will, will be no bystander on this journey. As climate change poses severe risks to price stability, central banks are required within their traditional mandates to strengthen their efforts to support a faster transition towards a more sustainable economy. And this is where I want to stop. Thank you very much. Isabel, thank you so much for that. Um, a very um, stirring walk through not just of the, the monetary policy, but very direct links into things like how businesses are faring and now business startups are, are actually uh, emerging in uh, across Europe at the moment. I'm going to turn it immediately to our second speaker, Sabine, Sabine Madar, uh, who's a member of the uh, Deutsche Bundesbank's executive board. Sabine, thank you so much for joining us and I'll pass over to you now. Yeah, many thanks, Rune. And yeah, first of all, I'm really happy to be part of this panel of, of really outstanding experts. Yeah, so ladies and gentlemen, today in Brussels, uh, the European Council is uh, dealing with one of the major building blocks for the European future, the recovery plan. And one central notion is shining through in this recovery plan. The future must be digital and, of course, sustainable. And on this panel, we'll focus um, on the sustainable part. Considering the urgency of the matter, let me please get straight down to the business. And as Isabelle also did it, uh, let's first of all talk about some parallels of COVID-19 and, and the climate change. It is easy to find similarities between the current pandemic and climate change. Both are sources of considerable financial risk. In terms of climate change, it took some time for financial markets to recognize the risk dimensions. Nowadays, ESG risk and climate change risk in particular have grown from nice to know to a must have factor in market participants' investment analysis. But this is not an easy task, but this is exactly where central banks enter this stage. So what I would like to do is to point out the role of the central banks in combating climate change. Central banks aim to helping financial markets to become more resilient against climate change. And this is essentially in central banks' own interest. Resilient financial markets are key requirements for monetary policy transmission to work and for the real economy to fund itself. 
a key to resilience is to better understand climate related risks and therefore financial markets need adequate data and models to price and manage climate related risks. In their roles uh, in supervision and as guardians of financial stability, central banks must ensure that climate risks are reflected in bank stress tests and accounted for disclosure and risk management practices. But central banks should also factor climate-related financial risk into their own risk management, more specifically into their credit assessment. And here the euro system relies on internal but also on external resources, including the rating agency. And there's a scope for improvement in both areas, but let's take a closer look at the rating agencies. Let's talk about the role of the rating agencies in this uh, part. In parallel with central banks, many other market participants also take their assessment into account. So all ratings agencies actually say, well, they are, uh, that they are incorporating ESG factors, including uh, climate change risk, at least indirectly. Um, but rating agency also flag challenges, including the differences between the rating horizon and the time horizon of climate change risk, the lack of high quality data and limited corporate disclosures on climate change risk. Some rating agencies seem to be more advanced than others and overall it is not entirely clear how climate change risks are considered in their credit ratings. So what stakeholders or market participants need are common standards for credit rating agencies on how to assess climate change risk, including standardized data, definitions, and of course, the weighing of the risk factors. These are what is needed, but the question is how to implement such common standards for rating agencies. And I think there are two approaches, main approaches. First, of course, we do have a regulatory approach to set common standards. The second opportunity would be to set market standards, market standards that are based on the consensus of major market players on the precise requirement for climate change risk assessment from the rating agencies. Well, market standards have their merits, especially if we're talking about the speed, the implementation speed, and they may also help authorities to develop a well-suited regulatory framework later on. So but let, maybe we'll just come back to their own, um, coming back to their own fields of operation apart from supervision and financial stability, central banks could also do more to better protect their own monetary policy portfolios. And that's what uh, Isabel also addressed. Um, I would like to be very clear. I think that central banks should start an open debate whether they should only purchase or accept securities from businesses that are adequately disclose climate-related risks. And that's what I also wrote in a Financial Times article already in February, and I still think this is something we need to discuss. But talking about disclosure, a key question is what kind of uh, disclosure do we need? There could be a stepwise approach over time. I think First, to start with qualitative information on climate change risk. And I think here some progress has already been made. But then in the second step in the medium term, we have to ask for quantitative information in order to better be able to assess central banks' climate change risk as exposure to the financial and to the non-financial sector. So let me put it in a nutshell. We need short and meaningful facts and figures about climate change risk within 
the medium term frame. Following this approach, the EURI system, by the way, would also support existing transparency initiatives. But now, since we've talked about strengthening the disclosure requirements, we also have to talk about possible burdens. Sure, disclosure and transparency generally come with a positive notion. But if you dig deeper, the complaints start. Complaints about unnecessary burdens. But let me address this issue. Yes, of course, strengthening disclosure rules requires additional efforts. But I do not share the opinion that these are unnecessary burdens. Disclosures will help all stakeholders to manage climate change risk more adequately. And as a result, capital can be allocated more effectively in the end. But to strike a balance between cost and benefit, the principle of proportionality must be observed. And the size of the entity has to be considered as well as the climate impact of economic, economic sectors. Sectors with a greater climate impact must be treated differently than others. And by the way, more transparency is not a competitive disadvantage, but I see it as an advantage. Better data helps to make market mechanism work. The market creates discipline for the benefit of climate protection and companies can benefit from this and those who want to get financially involved with them. So let me come to the conclusion. I would like to stop here because a renewed sustainable finance strategy and taxonomy are firmly in the field of the European Commission. Um, I have raised some issues. I uh, um, have raised some suggestions. Uh, I think it's a good starting point to discuss this and I'm more than happy to answer some of the questions that might, might um, evolve during the next um, presentation. Thank you very much. So Ben, thank you so much for that and, and also may I thank you for doing my job so beautifully because you've given us a perfect segue into our next speaker, so Emmanuel, Emmanuel Bittin, who is, uh, I think, the, the, a national expert uh, on sustainable finance at DG FISMA. Um, and I, I, I think, Emmanuel, you've been given a, a lovely intro there by Sabine, so thank you for that. Thank you very much uh, for, for the transition, Sabine. Uh, I, I'm very happy to, to be in this, uh, in this uh, panel today. I'm very honored to be here. Um, as we, we all know, we are in the middle of one of the biggest crises facing uh, Europe since the, the Second World War. And uh, moving on to the, to the next slide, please. Uh, we know that we are not only facing a pandemic of unprecedented proportions, but also a severe economic shock and a global order that is, uh, increasing, uh, that is increasingly under threat. So it is time in which government and European uh, action are crucial action to uh, fight the pandemic, uh, action to support our economies, and action to maintain international cooperation. It is also a time in which some may say, uh, could we please click on the pause button on all that sustainability talk? We must all reject this firmly and squarely. And I see three reasons for, for this. The first one is that because the, the coronavirus crisis is a sustainability-related uh, crisis. The, the outbreak underlines the link and risks associated with human activity, environmental degradation, and biodiversity loss with the social consequences our economies are now experiencing. But differently, differently uh, it reveals the insufficient integration of sustainability considerations in our economies and financial sector. Second, uh, we must reject the temptation of the post button and ensure sustainability and stable recovery because it's the only way to prevent massive disruption from climate change and to benefit from the economic and job opportunities related to the transition. A more sustainable uh, financial sector will be a more resilient financial sector. The magnitude of, of the impact of climate change and the, the environmental degradation on our economies and societies while being difficult to assess and central banks are, are doing their, their best to, to provide scenarios on what will be the, the impact of, of uh, climate change on our economies. 
these impacts may be much higher than as we have experienced uh, so far. We should expect more shocks to, to come in the century ahead, wildfire, storm, growth, uh, crop collapses, water scarcity. The sustainable recovery is also an opportunity. Uh, massive investments are needed to jumpstart our economies and massive investments are needed to reach the goal of uh, Paris Agreement. The state stability transition is a source of economic and employment opportunities and it's very clear for, for the European Commission. There is no trade-off between incentivizing a speedy recovery and continuing to support the stability transition. We cannot postpone the 2050 deadline uh, and wait uh, for the recovery to, to take place. We need to already embed all the policies in our, in our action. On the contrary, sustainability transition is a source of economic and employment opportunities. So it's not a surprise that uh, President von der Leyen has said that the European Green Deal should be the motor of our recovery. And the objectives set out in the European Green Deal are both very ambitious and indispensable. It's the, our collective duty to reach climate neutrality by 2050 and to prevent further environmental degradation. We must, we must bounce back better for, from this, uh, this pandemic and to build back better. The transition to a sustainable uh, economy will entail significant uh, investment efforts across all sectors, meaning that, that financing uh, frameworks, both public and private, uh, must support this overall direction in time of recovery. This is why uh, the, the unprecedented investment effort proposed by the Commission in the next generation EU will help to fast forwarding the green and digital transition. This will help to kickstart Europe's uh, economic recovery quickly at all levels, local, uh, national, and, and, uh, and European. But uh, moving to the, to the next slide, please. Uh, the, the financial challenges to reach the targets set in the, in the European Green Deal are extremely high, beyond the capacity of the public uh, sector only. We need all financial institutions to, to contribute to address this gap. In 2018, uh, you know that the Commission proposed an action plan on sustainable finance which aim at addressing the most urgent needs. And the first one is to define what is green. That's all the work we've done with the taxonomy. And we've done a lot of work, and by the end of the year, we'll be able to publish the first decade act on climate adaptation mitigation in this taxonomy. Um, but clearly, the financial system as a whole is not yet transitioning fast enough, and the needs are even higher with the coronavirus crisis. We need to shift the gear to a higher pace. For all these reasons, the European Green Deal announced a renewed sustainable finance strategy. It will improve the resilience of our systems and identify the new business opportunities. The renewed strategy needs to be more ambitious and not only address the needs of financial institutions, but now moving to real economy, to corporates, also public authorities, uh, citizens. To, to inform this, uh, this, uh, this uh, strategy, uh, we have launched a comprehensive consultation uh, that just closed uh, two days ago. Uh, we will do our analysis in the in the coming months, but just to give you a, a sense of the of the momentum, uh, we've received 650 responses to this to this uh, consultation, including 22% of citizens, which is very unusual for a consultation on financial regulation. Um, moving on to the to the next slide, please. I, I would like to explain a bit how we conceive this this consultation and how the the, the strategy will be designed, because we consider that there are uh, three pillars. Uh, that are indispensable to achieve our, our ambition. The first one is to strengthen the, the foundations for sustainable investment by creating the enabling framework with all appropriate tools and structure. The idea with this first pillar is to, to finalize what we started with the 2018 action plan. For instance, we have launched some reflection on the counting standards. Should we move forward on, on this? Uh, all the reflection on standards and labels. In particular, we have an ongoing consultation on the Green Bond Framework and whether we need a regulatory uh, framework for this. But we have seen in the last month here that there are new uh, types of assets in the market, sustainability-linked bonds, uh, social bonds, uh, new types of loans also. So should we also broaden our, our reflection on this, uh, on these new standards and labels? We know that there are huge questions also around the, the sustainable research and ratings uh, markets, in particular around the quality, reliability, transparency of, of this market. So we also want to consider whether we need to take action in this, uh, in this market. Finally, there is in this first pillar a very promising area of work, which is the, the corporate governance uh, and how to better embed 
sustainability uh, in, in corporate practices. But it, it's not about strengthening only about strengthening the foundation, but also about increasing the opportunities. So it, it's the second pillar. How can we, in all uh, all, all dots of the, of the value chain of the, the financial finance value chain, how can we improve the opportunities for all citizens, investors, and corporate? Here we, we want to embrace all the, the value chain from retail investors. What can we do to make sure retail investors are offered the product they want when they, pre, they have sustainability preferences? Moving on to, to, to also the, the types of assets, uh, green securitization, for instance, can provide an avenue of work. Uh, uh, until all, until the, the, the project pipeline, how can we increase the project pipeline? Because we know that there is a lack also of, of green projects that to be, to, to be financed. Uh, is there a need for incentives? The second pillar is how to make sure that we increase opportunities not only in the EU but globally. How the EU can uh, help other countries to make the transition and finance also their, their transition. The last pillar is on uh, exactly what supervisors have, been, have asked us to, to do, is to better integrate climate and environmental risks in the, uh, in, in the, in the regulation. and how it has changed also our approach of, of sustainability um, in, in the last month. Um, when we first designed the, 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 the consultation, the, the, the impact of coronavirus was, was really uh, at an early stage. So now we want to make sure in, in the future strategy that we embed a new uh, aspect of sustainability, which, is, which are first, the social angle. The current crisis has catalyzed a change in citizens' expectations, both for companies and financial system overall. Uh, we've seen also a lot of new issues, for instance, on social bonds. So we've seen innovative approach of, of this issue. So uh, we would like to make a greater emphasis on, on social issues in the renewed uh, strategy. The second new aspect in, in the renewed strategy with the, the crisis is the resilient anger. A more sustainable, fin uh, sustainable financial system means more resilient economies and societies uh, toward our uh, toward climate and environmental risks. Uh, one specific aspect is interesting here, I think, is biodiversity. Uh, it's a risk that was not considered first. Uh, we were focusing on climate, but biodiversity risk is more and more analyzed as, as something very uh, transformative. Entire economic uh, sectors uh, directly depend on variety of plants, animals, and insects. And we are approaching a global biodiversity threshold, which if, if we curse, can lead to significant and possibly irreversible decrease in global biodiversity. So we need also, we like to improve uh, the integration of biodiversity risk in our strategy. The last point is on how uh, our tools, the tools we designed for financial markets first, can be used also uh, for, the, for the recovery. Uh, the view taxonomy, for instance, can, can provide a, a good avenue for, for reflection on this. Climate benchmarks, uh, the real green bonds, they are all tools available for both public and private institutions to uh, develop their, their thinking around the recovery. Finally, uh, all of these efforts create the enabling framework allowing all financial institutions to make their transition. Uh, the sustainable finance tools such as taxonomy, green bonds, uh, so called companies disclosure are also available for central banks in their efforts to incorporate climate and environmental related risks and opportunities while of course respecting their, their independence. In this perspective, it's really impressive to see the, the multiple actions taken by the ECB and the EU system uh, in the last years to reflect climate risk. And also the, 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 the role of the ECB in the NGFS, the leading role uh, also of the Bundesbank in this uh, very important network. And it is encouraging to see the recent declaration uh, of uh, Christine Lagarde to explore uh, avenue uh, available to combat the climate change. Um, it, it's also very interesting that in the context of the review, climate change will be a part of the, of the discussion. So to, to conclude, the, the work done by the ECB, the SSM, and the Commission is, is 
complementary and should be mutually reinforcing the, the <clears throat> and, and for us clearly the, the renewed strategy strive to provide additional great tools to ensure that sustainability risks and opportunities are properly uh, addressed. Thank you very much. There, thank you so much for, 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 for taking us through that and, and, and if you like for, for taking us through from how we look at the, the issues of sustainable finance and into um, into the future where we're going to have to think much more seriously about the resilience, about the social issues as well. This, 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 this crisis is teaching us a lot as, as we go through it. Um, I'm delighted to pass on now to, to our good colleague Pierre Munin from the, the Council on Economic Policies, who is going to give us some reflections on the, the, the central bank role here today. So, Pierre, over to you. Thank you, Rona. Um, it's a pleasure to be part of this panel. Um, as um, it was highlighted several times in the previous presentation, uh, if we want to move to, to a sustainable economy uh, after, after this crisis, it will require the effort of all of us, of our several stakeholders, governments, financial markets. But uh, I would like to focus today on, on what can central bank do and I think what, can, what, must, central, what central bank must do to, um, to um, guide us or lead us to, to this uh, sustainable future. Now let me start with a picture uh, of um, what is in front of us. And obviously, this is not a picture that describes a sustainable future. And this is not uh, um, you know, a boat that we would like to, to embark on to sail, to sail this ocean with such tsunami in front of us. Uh, I, I would like to focus on, on the last wave on climate change and to tell you a bit how central bank can help decrease this wave and then make the ocean a bit flatter and, and saleable for, for all of us. Um, let me first tell you that um, most of what central bank can do has already been described by uh, both uh, Isabel Schnabel and Sabine Maudara. I would like to emphasize that the solutions are there what is needed now is action and uh, it's uh, it's action now because the, the, the longer we wait the more difficult it will be to reach a state uh, that, that uh, we would like uh, what do we know about the climate change ri risk in front of us i think most of, of you have, have read uh, the excellent work of the ngfs on that in which uh, the european central bank and and um, uh, the Bundesbank are part of. Um, so, so this group of more than 60 central banks and regulators have, have given a very good description of what lies in front of us. And, and the conclusion are, are clear. Uh, climate change risk are material for all agents in the economy, including financial markets. Uh, these risks are foreseeable and irreversible. They will materialize in the future in one form or the, or the other with certainty. So we know what will happen. And most importantly, what will happen, the path that we will take depends on, on short-term action. So including the short-term action taken by Central Bank. Let me be a bit more precise on, on, on where do we go. So, so there are several paths that are possible for, for us now. So it's a business as usual uh, scenario where nobody, nobody, nothing changes and we end up uh, with a, war, a global warming uh, from four to five degree, uh, and and you are you have what is currently planned by policies, which which end up uh, in a, in a three degree world, or there is uh, the, the a transition that is happening where we end up in one point five to two degree warm um, global warming. So that's the possibilities that are in front of us and clearly what we would like to happen is the transition. And this, we, want, we would like to have the transition for two reasons. First, it's the option that minimizes the cost for our society. And I think most importantly for, for central banks, it's also the path that uh, 
is consistent with uh, the, the lower risk for, for financial markets. So I think all central banks are, have a role in terms of, of financial stability. They have a mandate of um, guaranteeing or improving financial stability. And if you want to um, stabilize financial markets uh, regarding climate change, then the best way to do it is to have a transition. And, and this, is, this is not new. Uh, it has already, be, already been highlighted by the European System Risk Board, ESRB, in 2016. That's already four years ago. And, and this report was clear in saying a transition is, is the, the, um, the future that, that leads to, to the more stable markets. And we not only need a transition, but we need a, um, a smooth and early transition. One of the worst scenarios that we can have is to have a too late and too sudden transition. And I think the COVID crisis really showed us how um, like sudden and, and sharp transition from one state to the other, from, from normal economy to a lockdown. When we have a sharp transition from one system to the other, how um, dangerous it is for, for, for our financial system. And we are in the same, in the same uh, situation with climate change. What we would like is a smooth transition that starts now. And that's why, uh, and, and it can only start now if policies, policy choice taken now uh, are fostering the, the transition to a low carbon economy. Um, so that's, that's basically what we want. And um, the question is, do central banks lead us to or, or foster this, this transition? And uh, my, my answer would be, would be no right now, because, uh, and, and especially after the answer of, of, uh, of the ECB and other central banks to the COVID crisis, what we have seen, um, after the crisis is a bit more of the same of the same tools that were used in the precedent crisis in 2009 and 2012 for, for Europe. And, and, and these tools are very good and very efficient to avoid a, a recession or just to stabilize market, but they are not aligned with, with a, they are not, not aligned with the transition. What we have seen in the past, and that's all studies that I'm showing you now, and I think what the ECB has done uh, with the COVID crisis is a bit of the same, is that the asset purchase, purchased by central banks are tilted, are biased toward, um, toward uh, um, sectors that are um, polluting. And, and, and this, this reflects not the choice of, of the central banks, but it reflects the, the state of the market. Uh, and, and, and the neutrality, um, um, the, the neutrality um, choice that uh, Ms. Mauder was, was saying is, is, was, was uh, alighting leads to, to basically copy the market. And we know that the market now, markets now are not aligned with, with, uh, with the transition. So what can central bank do to, to change this situation? Um, I think there is one thing that the ECB and other central bank absolutely must do right now is to, to take into account climate, climate risk in their monetary policy operation. So asset purchases, collateral operation, and, 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 and refinancing operation. And one reason why they must do that is that um, basically the ECB has committed, as, as, as its own guideline says, that they should implement monetary policy by taking the minimum exposure of the balance sheet. And, and what we know, and that's also um, been highlighted by several uh, bodies, is that financial markets are very bad now at uh, pricing climate risk. So the prices and the indicators and the information used by markets to, to price climate risk is, uh, is I mean, doesn't doesn't reflect the, this climate risk, and I'm and I'm not I'm not the only one saying that uh, this 
first sentence that you see here come from, again, the European System, uh, Systemic Risk Board in his last report. And the NGFS says the same thing. And, and or I can also cite the Bank of England that really say that uh, financial markets, financial institutions now have a gap in assessing climate risk. So on one side, you have um, central banks saying uh, financial markets do not integrate climate risk into their, uh, really integrate climate risk, and they should do it. They should protect their balance sheet against this climate risk. And on the other side, you have ECB relaying on the same uh, information as, as, um, as financial market to, uh, to manage your risk on their whole balance sheet. It's like, for me, it's like if, if the CEO of one big banks, let's say uh, Deutsche Bank or, or Paribas, saying, we, are, we know that there is a risk in front of us, but we don't do anything to protect our own balance sheet. And that's a bit of a contradiction. That, uh, and, and I think um, people at the ECB are very aware of that. You have here two citations from Christina Gahn and Jens Weinmann who already who say that they should uh, re-examine collateral to integrate climate risk and they should re-ask themselves questions about the, the climate risk that, is, uh, that comes with the assets. So there is an awareness, but I think what is needed now is not only, uh, I mean, you know, uh, action has be are better than words. So the ECB must act now. Act now on that and 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 for me it's clear they do they should act now because i think it's their fiduciary fiduciary duty to protect the balance sheet of the SAB, the ecb against climate risk against undue losses and i see no excuse for me not to do it now because they are there are usable climate risk metrics that are available on the market already i can cite cite you more than 20 uh, data providers that provide such, such metrics. Of course, they are, they are work in progress, but they are already in, advanced enough for investors to use it, including the ECB. And I think one, one precautionary principle would be to say it's better to use imperfect risk, risk metrics than not to use any risk metrics and miss, and miss uh, climate risk. Um, so, so I think there is no uh, excuse now from from any central bank not to already start including this risk by using the risk metrics that are available now and i would say that the ecb risk management framework is actually very fit for including these risks um, i mean as it was said um, the ecb rely on, on rating agency but also on internal uh, re, uh, risk uh, assessing framework on uh, on, on Counterparty risk assessing risk assessing system. So there is a, a panel a panel of information that the ECB is using for for risk assessment, and uh, they can mix these these uh, sources of, of information as they want. It's allowed to assess uh, a climate risk, um, and, and and I think there is no need to change anything. Uh, in, in, in the, the framework or the institutional framework of risk management at the ECB to already take climate risk into account. So for me, this is a must. Now you also have some other um, um, proposition that were also mentioned. Um, I think the ECB should use all its policy tools to foster the transition. And, and why the ECB should do that? Because the ECB has a mandate of financial stability. And as we have seen, the most secure way for, for, to guarantee uh, financial st stability on, on markets is to have a, an early and smooth transition. So whenever, so, 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 that's, so whenever the ECB is, is, um, is implementing a policy, it should also have this financial stability mandate, mandate in mind and say, well, if, this policy uh, help the transition, it will help financial stability. And that, on a, in addition to, um, to the first, um, to the primary mandate of price stability, that's what I mentioned by uh, Isabel Schneibel, it's the financial stability mandate. 
And on top of that, I will not go into details, but it's also part of the second drug mandate of the ECB to, to uh, include environmental goal. And I think for that, all monetary policy operation can actually now reflect climate consideration. You could have climate consideration in your, the choice of your asset purchases. You uh, can add climate consideration in uh, targeting long-term refinancing operation by saying, for example, that banks that do not, um, uh, that lend to, to polluting sector, for example, are, are, will not get uh, a good condition in Tietro. It can be reflected in the collateral framework. And, and, and by doing so, the ECB would, would steer uh, a bit the market and realign it on the transition, which is uh, a good thing for financial stability reason. Um, so let me let me conclude with what I think the ECB must do. As I said, uh, the ECB and any central bank. I say I'm saying the same thing here in Switzerland. Uh, the ECB must integrate climate risk into monetary policy operation. It's a fiduciary duty. It's feasible, and uh, and and. Can we really start? Um, so, so some investors are already doing it, not all of them, so there is no reason why to you know, delay this integration for one or two years. Uh, and I think the ECB should also reflect climate consideration in the implementation of monetary policy, essentially for financial stability reasons, because the transition, a transition to a low carbon economy is the best way to protect financial markets against uh, instability. And, and finally, I would really like to emphasize that any delayed action, action of climate risk from the ECB would only worsen the situation for financial stability. So the, 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 the more we wait, the less likely it is that we, we will have a smooth uh, transition. And, and, and as, I, as the ESRB highlighted, uh, a too late and too sudden transition is really the worst scenario that we can have. So, the ECB and any other uh, environment um, European um, institution, uh, when taking decision, should have that in mind and see if there is not a way to have one um, to, to have one one policy tools that can be also used for for the transition. So let me conclude with that. I'm happy to to see the reaction after. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. So, 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 so the sense that uh, uh, action is necessary, action is possible, and that action indeed has already begun. It may be a question of, of how we accelerate it or develop it to, 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 to smooth that transition. Um, I'm going to turn now to, to Thierry Philippona, uh, who is our last speaker this morning at Research and Advocacy at Finance Watch. Thierry, over to you. Thank you very much, Ronan. Uh, it's a great honor and pleasure to be exchanging with you this morning. Um, if you allow me, I'd like to address two block subjects. The first block is really perhaps asking a few questions or raising a few points on the sustainability dimension of the recovery policies, whether fiscal or monetary, we think being put in place at the moment. And the second block of reflections I'd like to make will really take a concrete exam example as to what central banks, central bankers, supervisors can and perhaps must do to tackle the link between climate change and financial stability. But it, let, let, let me start sorry, with a few reflections about um, what can, about the current recovery packages. Um, the first thing that strikes me is that there's often a debate about between a supposed conflict about the uh, possible, um, um, or, sorry, conflict between the sustainability of debt and the sustainability of the world. And I'd like to assess that there is no such thing as the possibility of a sustainable debt in an unsustainable world. 
And, um, and sometimes I find that the debates that we hear publicly, you know, take us in a direction that goes nowhere. If anything, the COVID crisis has shown that a sustainability, in this particular case, a health crisis, can lead to an economic crisis, and that can trigger financial instability. And that makes debt, whether public or private, just explode. So if we don't have a sustainable world, there will be no such thing as a sustainable debt. So this is very, very important to bear in mind because sometimes the debates I feel we, we hear take us nowhere on that front. So once we've said that, what do we need to do? I think Isabel said something extremely important when, when she said at the start of, of your intervention, Isabel, you said, we need, and I'm reading the, you know, the notes I took, we need a structural change to our economy. And this is a very, very important assertion um, because basically supporting unsustainable activities, whether through fiscal or monetary policies, will feed what we like to call at Finance Watch disruption risk. And disruption risk is really the fact that the economy comes to a halt because the world is not sustainable. And I, I will talk about disruption risk again in, in one or two minutes when, when we talk about the link between climate change and financial stability, because it strikes us that when we talk about, well, that link between financial stability and climate risk, we always talk about transition risk. We talk a little bit, well, we address a little bit physical risk, and we never talk about what is, in our view, by far the biggest risk, which is disruption risk. You know, climate change will be an order of magnitude bigger in terms of impact, in terms of impact than the COVID crisis was. Okay, and COVID crisis has a terrible impact on our economies, our financial system, and on debt. So there's no way we can think, in our view, about climate change without thinking about disruption risk. But I will come back to that in a minute. Um, you know, when, when I start to, you know, and, and the objective this morning is really to think together. I'm not affirming anything. I'm trying to, you know, put a number of subjects in the debate. But we'll need to think about whether what we're doing is the right thing or not. The other thing is there cannot be, and that goes back again to what Isabel was saying, there cannot be any sustainable world without substantial investments towards a sustainable economy, but also, and I know this is a very contentious subject, away from unsustainable economies, uh, activities. It, it, is, it is just physically not possible. So let me go directly into a very concrete examples, example of what can be done to tackle the link between financial stability and climate change. First of all, we're facing that incredible situation today where we have a vicious circle with a doom loop between the financial sector and climate change. Why is that? Because basically the financial sector is the enabler of, of climate change, as in it provides the finance that makes CO2 emissions possible, but at the same time, everybody recognizes and central banks and, and GFS and all the people who've studied the, the topic seriously, that climate change will threaten financial stability, hence the doom loop, hence the vicious circle. Finance makes climate change possible. It doesn't create ch climate change itself. It makes it possible. It is the enabler, but at the same time, it will be threatened, it is threatened, and will be perhaps destroyed by climate change. So we have that doom loop. And supervisors and central banks are facing, I think, a double paradox here. First paradox is that one thing is certain. Certainty is that climate change will have an impact on financial stability. Everybody recognizes this today, and it's been said before me. But at the same time, there's a complete uncertainty, there's a radical uncertainty on the quantification of what will happen. You know, we're, we're facing, some people call it radical uncertainty. Um, you know, there's many ways of describing this, but effectively quantifying precisely the impact of climate change is something 
the most optimistic observer says very difficult and the vast majority of people who've worked in it say it is impossible. And the reason why it's impossible is actually very simple to understand because the way we as the community working on this topics operate is that basically to quantify something, we take the relevant data, we fit it into a model that we think is as clever as possible, and then there is a result telling us, okay, the effect is this. But the reality is that we don't have the data for an absolutely obvious reasons, is that we're talking about something that is ahead of us. So, you know, there's no such thing as forward-looking data. So if we don't have the data, we cannot quantify what will happen. And yeah, I'll give you a very concrete example. I have the privilege of sitting on one of the committees of one of the central banks working on the calibration of so-called climate, you know, climate stress tests of financial institutions. The reality, and, and we all know that, is that those climate stress tests are not climate stress tests. And why are they not climate stress tests? Because central banks are saying, look, you know, we cannot come to the conclusion that the capital shortfall of financial institutions is X or Y in this situation because we cannot quantify. And they are absolutely right to, 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 to say that. This is, this is reality. And, the, and that reality is linked to that lack of data I was just mentioning, but also the fact that when you look at the fine print of what those so-called climate stress tests, which are effectively scenario-based analysis uh, do, they look, pretty seriously at disruption risk. Some of them look at physical risk, but not all of them. And none of them looks at disruption risk. So effectively, it's an interesting, or they are interesting exercises. It's, it's good to, to improve our understanding of the situation, but it, it, there's no way it can lead to a conclusion that will lead to meaningful action. So we, we have that big paradox there. And then the next question is, you know, so what? You know, do we sit here and decide that we, we're going to do nothing or do we act anyway? And I'd like to say something here is that a lot of pressure is put on central banks and supervisors to say, do more, do better. And I, I share the view and, you know, Pierre said a number of things that I completely share. So I'm not disputing that, you know, central banks could do sometimes differently, sometimes better, uh, and we need to discuss that. But there is so much that regulators and central banks can do, and policymakers and legislators must also take their responsibilities and change the rules. If you go back to what I was saying about the link between climate change and financial stability, well, effectively, if you cannot quantify it, you must assume to take a qualitative approach to to tackle that link. And that qualitative approach is very simple. Um, if you take, thinking European Union here, obviously, if you take the capital requirements regulation, it has a provision saying that if a risk is particularly high, then a risk weight of 150% should apply to that risk for banking institutions. I look at the CO2 exposures of banks. And I ask myself, well, is that risk particularly high in a stranded asset context after a month where we had BP and Shell announcing together almost 40 billion um, um, write-offs, uh, asset depreciations, uh, because basically, you know, the value of their reserves is going down? Well, the answer is obviously yes, the risk you know, here again, in a stranded asset environment, of fossil fuel exposures is particularly high. And then I look at the regulation and I, and I see that, for instance, private equity, and I don't think anybody, any of us is disputing the, the, the importance of private equity, has 150% risk weight applied. We look at the same regulation, we see that real estate property has the same, same sort of risk weight applied. And we look at fossil fuel exposure and it gets the normal treatment of 100% uh, uh, risk weight. Effectively, what we're saying is that there is an incoherence, an inconsistency of the regulation when it comes to addressing the risk. And if we don't address that sort of issues, effectively, when 
the climate change crisis really strikes, we're going to be facing a situation where we will be accumulating the effect of climate change and another financial crisis. And that would be absolutely terrible. And let's think together also about what can and should be done about the new exposures that banks or financial institutions in general take for to to you know vis-a-vis -vis, uh, fossil fuel uh, fossil fuel um, uh, reserves. When you think about it, exploring today for new fossil fuel reserves comes down to accelerating the race towards climate change. And if you think stranded assets again, you know if on existing exposures you have a high likelihood of losing a substantial part of the value of the reserves on the new exposures. And we all know that, you know, exploring for new reserves and exploiting them, you're talking about 10, 20, 30 years, you know, it is certain, and I mean the certain, that the value of those new exposures will be more or less entirely lost. Why am I saying we are certain? Well, the carbon budget of the planet and the IPCC is absolutely um, you know, has no hesitation on, on this. Carbon budget of the planet is between 10 and 15 years. So if we're starting to explore for something that will start producing in, well, 10, 15, 20 years from now, you know, we know that this is going to be lost in value. So therefore, you know, there would be a very simple argument for saying from a prudential standpoint, and, and my approach is entirely risk-based, you should submit those exposures to pure equity financing. You know, if you're certain you want to take the risk, fine. You know, financial institutions should be allowed to take the risk they're willing to take because it's their job. It's not the job of supervisors to tell them, take this risk, don't take it. But it's the job of supervisors of saying, look, if I think there is a particularly high risk or a risk of losing the entire value of your exposure, then finance it through equity, because if you don't finance it through equity, you know, we know there will be a, a risk to financial stability. So really the main point I wanted to make here is that first of all, Europe has the weapons to tackle the link between uh, climate change and financial stability. Um, that is called capital requirements regulation. B, that through a pure qualitative approach, we can resolve the apparent paradox of we want to quantify, but we don't know how to quantify, and see that, yes, supervisors, and I've discussed this issue with uh, quite a number of, of central bankers and people in charge of financial stability. Yes, of course, central bankers can and must do many things, but on that front, it's also up to legislators and governments to take their responsibilities and give the rules that supervisors can uh, can and uh, and will apply. Um, okay, well, I could I could continue for a long time, but I think we need to keep time for the discussion. So I will I will just stop here. Thank you, thank thank you so much, and and it, it, I think it, it, it's been really wonderful because it's kind of firstly just a reminder of the scope of the work of central banks but also you've reminded us that they also work within a much wider framework where there are a whole lot of other people involved in in um in this and i think it's really uh, important that, that we think about that in in the 15 minutes uh remaining so I, what I was was wondering, what I, I was proposing to do now is I'm going to go back to to our first three speakers in turn because firstly you you mapped out questions about the, the, the roles, the supervisory roles, the monetary stability roles, etc. Um, we've heard some very interesting things then in terms of the the relative both the powers and the the kind of tools, the analytic tools that you have, and then questions about so. How are you using those? And I think brought up by uh, Thierry in his piece, but also by my, my E3G colleague, Tanami, in the, the Q&A, what might then be blockers in your space? And, and, and so could I turn perhaps first to you, Isabel, and just reflect on, on those questions from your perspective? 
Uh, you, Arthur, you'll need to unmute Isabel. I have to. Um, Can you hear me now? Ah, okay. So thank you very much. I, I mean, I think that um, the all these speeches were so uh, so fascinating and interesting. And uh, what I find very encouraging is that uh, at least uh, among um, a relatively large group of people, there is a consensus emerging about uh, the role that also central banks uh, can play. I mean, I should stress it's not everybody, right? So, um, I mean, of course, there, there are also uh, people who are quite uh, uh, critical. And, uh, but I, I think we're all on a very good track to convince those because the arguments are getting stronger and stronger. So one point I, I would like to stress again, which was also in my speech, and uh, this is uh, probably directed at, uh, at the commission, is that I mean, the, the single most important instrument for uh, climate policy, in my view, is global carbon pricing. And I think we, it's really very important. I mean, all the other things are incredibly important, but the, the really crucial instrument is carbon pricing. And we have to get going there as well. So it's not, I mean, I know the experience from, from Germany relatively well, where a lot of money has been spent uh, um, and uh, compared to the money spent, the effect, I think, was too small, right? And so we really, I think, a lot of, um, uh, we need uh, uh, a lot of uh, a movement that uh, push towards carbon pricing, I mean, at European level, by expanding the ETS, but then, of course, also going uh, beyond. And that's the second part, of course, we need global initiatives. Um, I mean, I, I, uh, I think it's very important that Europe is, is doing uh, quite a bit and is moving forward. But we have, of course, to be aware of the fact that in the end, we need uh, a global uh, movement. And uh, I think this is uh, incredibly uh, important. On all the other things, uh, I, I really believe, and that was, um, that was mentioned, I think, by, by Pierre, by Thierry. Uh, I mean, we have to stop using excuses. So there are many excuses. We, have, we don't have data. We don't know how to measure it. And it's all true. But we have to, we have to get going. And uh, we have to, uh, I mean, uh, I, I think it was uh, Pierre uh, who, who said that. I mean, it's, it's better to, to do it in an imperfect way than not doing it at all. And this uh, concerns many of the, the areas uh, that, um, uh, that uh, you mentioned. And uh, I must really say I... Uh, I agree to, to many of those things that were said, and therefore I, I don't think we have enough time to talk about the, the details, uh, but I can, I can tell you that I'm very much in line. Um, Isabel, can I just uh, ask a follow on there, which is from a, I, I, I can see as a, a microeconomist the value of pricing in terms of the action of individuals and the action of firms. What does carbon pricing mean to you from a central bank perspective? So, I mean, um, so if we had uh, like perfect carbon pricing, then uh, which, which is something which we won't get uh, tomorrow and therefore in any case, Indeed. even if we have the plan to do that, we need uh, all the other measures that we uh, discussed, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. then um, the, the, the markets uh, would um, uh, more properly price the existing uh, risks. I mean, that is uh, basically, so we, we would internalize the externalities. And if it's done properly, this would also include the uh, externalities uh, in, in principle on, um, on financial stability, even though that one may mm -hmm. uh, have to think about whether that is automatically the case. But in any case, um, I mean, you would automatically get this fundamental repricing in the economy, uh, which, uh, which is crucial. And therefore, I really think this is the most important uh, tool and that then affects uh, all of our monetary policy uh, uh, automatically. But I'm not saying that it's, it's uh, uh, sufficient, but I think that is really the most important thing. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
And, and, and we have also stored up a, a question for Emmanuel in a couple of moments. Thank you for that. Sabine, I was going to, to turn to you next. And, and I was also going to just, just reflect on, on the, the, the things that, that um, I think it was Thierry particularly referred to in, in, in terms of how you know what it is that you are purchasing. Because I remember you expressly mentioned rating agencies as one of those instruments in, in, in your talk. So I don't want you to, I don't mean to force you exclusively to think about that, but if you could just reflect on that too, it would be wonderful. Yeah, thank you, Ronan. Uh, first, I think it really fits very well with what's said by, by Thierry, but by Pierre and now by Isabel as well. I think, um, first of all, I think it's not the time to, to still justify why we are why we should do something or we, why we should take care and i even now in our presentations i just realized that most of the time was spent why do we have to act and i think we should really leave this uh this path and and start on how how we're gonna deal with that of course, there are still people we have to convince that's true, that's true, but I think there's not that much time left to still looking for justifications, excuses, and so on. So uh, just as a starting remark, let's, let's focus on the how, right? And coming back to the how, um, coming back also to rating agencies is, I think Thierry, you said, well, let's, let's not wait for high quality, uh, quality of data. Let's start with qualitative um, information. And, um, and Isabel at the same time said, well, it's crucial that we have uh, the correct, that, that climate race is priced in, uh, in, in, in the market, right? And, and to me, the crucial point is that we need information and that we need to evaluate these informations. And that leads me to two things that I would wanted to address in my speech as well is, first of all, I think data are there or data could be generated. So what we need to do is we have to ask the real economy, but also the financial sector to analyze their um, risk ex exposure, right? That, that's what they have to do. Some of them do that already. Uh, unfortunately, most of them rather on a qualitative approach, but I think the tools and, and here said that are there, so, so it is possible to generate data. And of course, you have to start with estimations. You have to um, protect, uh, project um, situations. What we now do at the NGFS is we have a, um, a project that um, where we do try to quantify the risk, um, the climate risk of every jurisdiction. And how we do we do that? Of course, we have six different basis scenarios. And on that, we just try to, to use to generate data we can feed into those basis uh, uh, scenario. And then probably by, hopefully by end of 2021, we hope that we get some um, figures and data um, that shows how how much will a, a, a climate risk cost each jurisdiction, right? Of course, this is an estimation. This is not uh, into detail and, and um, for granted that those figures are, uh, show the, re the, 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 real, um, uh, um, the real situation, but it is an approach. And um, coming back to the role of the rating agencies, for me, it is crucial that they play their role because I need to judge on, and, and the market needs to judge on how, how severe is the climate risk each issuer um, um, uh, is exposed to, right? And the rating agencies only can do that if they themselves have the information. So I think it's everything is, is connected. So without disclosure rules, we do have not uh, the, the data. Uh, uh, if we do not have the data, the rating agencies cannot uh, do their job. And, and so we cannot do that because, as Pierre said, um, the, the credit ratings are not only done by the uh, rating agencies, but also by the central banks uh, itself, right? And so all of us need, need those information and those uh, data. So um, I think to, to summarize what we need is clear disclosure rules. 
And this is certainly not the part of, of the uh, central banks. That's where I would uh, like uh, get back to the, the European Commission. Um, I think we need, uh, and, and they are, there are some, um, uh, some ways to, to uh, re review um, uh, the disclosure rules. What we need is a clear way from a broader binding uh, regulation. And secondly, what we need is more quantitative um, uh, information. Um, so this is the part definitely of the fiscal policy. What we then have to discuss is the role of the rating agencies. How can we uh, rely on, on what on their assessments? And for me, uh, it is very important that they have the mm. common standards. And uh, the common standards is so crucial because I have a personal experience. I checked our own um, uh, portfolio and the results uh, were, were fine, but the, the, the difference between the estimations and the evaluation was so huge that I myself asked, well, what, of what value is these, uh, this estimation by the uh, rating agencies? So I mm -hmm. think we have to come to a point where they are comparable, have, use the same data, factor the same, the, the risk factors have the same weight and they have the same definition of risk. Right? So this, these two uh, points for me are very crucial. So I leave it with that. Can, so, I, can I just jump in on, to react on, on that? Just very briefly, uh, because very, very, otherwise it was a beautiful yeah. segue to Emmanuel, which I'm going very to use true. again. Very, very briefly, I just wanted to say that you know, we just started a, um, a study on, on, on climate risk data providers and we already asked 20 data providers. So I think the data are there, even if they are imperfect, they are there. And then, mm -hmm. as you say, it's a how now, and, and, and it's a matter of yeah. looking at the data and cho choosing some of them. Emmanuel, turning to you, it isn't all in the Commission's gift, but it would be good to hear what, what your reflections on it, but also kind of your overarching reflections on the sustainable finance dimension here. So thank you very much. So just to answer maybe on the, on the price, uh, on the carbon price, we, we all know it's absolutely critical. It gives the, the market the, the signal uh, about the way forward and how to internalize these risks. Uh, that's why in the, in the context of the, of the Green Deal, we announced that we are going to work to also integrate, uh, for instance, the maritime sector in the European trading, uh, European, uh, sorry, emission trading system uh, allowance, and also to look at the the free allowances for for airlines. So we are we are fully aware. Um, and and just to add on this uh, on this carbon price, another aspect is also of course taxation uh, because carbon price is made of, of both of the market and then on, on the second leg is on. Uh, the taxation aspect, um, we know that it's a very difficult topic uh, in the EU, especially given the, the competence of the Commission in this area and also the, the political sensitivity of, of this topic uh, in, uh, also in member states in, in view of the Yellow Jacket, for instance, in, in France. Uh, so it, it's a quite sensitive topic, but the Commission is very committed to, to also deliver on this. Uh, we'll make uh, proposals to, to ensure that uh, taxation supports the, the, the EU climate uh, uh, neutrality objective um, in, in, the, in the coming uh, months, uh, years. Um, so we are working on this carbon price, but still, um, and I think just the last point on this, we see already some kind of the results. Uh, it's still preliminary, but for instance, the, the carbon price just reached 30 euros, euros in, in last week, I think, is the first time since 2006. Um, during the last crisis, uh, it, it, it's the, complete, the, the, the opposite uh, happened when the, the, I think the price was around five euros. So uh, we, we see that all the, the tools, the work we've been doing in this common price might be working. Uh, nothing is the definitive, but still it's a good, it's a good sign. Um, but uh, we know that uh, common price alone uh, will not be sufficient. We need also to, to give um, uh, companies uh, uh, a sense of where they can be going for the transition on how to transition that's one of the purpose of the of the taxonomy which identifies that the best in class the the ones that are the, the activities that are already aligned with our 2020 or 50 objective so we are providing companies uh, not only the, the, the bad incentives the price but also the way forward what are the activities 
uh, that are aligned with, uh, with our objective. So um, it will also help financial institutions to identify these, uh, these, uh, these, these companies that are making the effort and channeling the difference to this, to this one. So I, I agree, carbon price is absolutely important, but it's not the only tool. Uh, and given sometimes the, 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 the political issues with this kind of, uh, of tool, we need to look at all the policy tools uh, we have. Uh, also, uh, for instance, financial regulation, but also all environmental regulations and climate regulations we are, we are creating in addition to the only the, the price. Um, so we are, we are looking at all the tools we can we can use to make this uh, internalization of biodexternalities in in the system and also help companies to, to transition themselves. Um, maybe just a few words on the disclosure. Um, indeed, it's uh, I mean it, it's not only helpful for 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 central banks for supervisors but also for all financial markets to to understand what are the risks they are taking when they make an investment in a in a, in a company. So. It's something we've been looking at for, for uh, two years now, and we've done a consultation until uh, last month on, on this issue and on the way forward for us. We'll, um, we are preparing our, our work on this, and we'll see uh, early next week what are the exact uh, follow-up, uh, what is our decision on the, the revision. But already the, the Vice President has announced that uh, the, he has asked one, one standard setter, the FRAG, to work on on the standards, uh, on what exactly we could be asking uh, for the for the disclosure on, on climate and environmental issues, um, it, it was it's also a way, uh, as Pierre mentioned, there are there are data now. But the thing is that there may be too many, too much data, too 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 many types of methodologies to assess the data. So, for instance, in disclosure, we see that there are multiple uh, standards, SASB, uh, GRI. Uh, CFD, of course, so maybe there, there is a, a need to organize a bit this uh, for, for the European market. Uh, another uh, area of work very important in, in this um, is sustainability ratings and, and, and research. It, it, the market has emerged in the last years, and uh, we know that there are a lot of questions around the quality, transparency um, of this market. So it's something we, we would like to cover in the, in the renewal strategy. Uh, of course, I cannot say what exactly will be the, the, the actions because we are, st we are still analyzing the, the consultation, but it's an area that we have clearly identified, so we will work on, uh, on this. Thank you very much. No, th thank you very much. And, and I must apologize to, 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 to all our speakers and our attendees that I have let this run over. You should never share something that is too interesting because you get too involved. That, that This has been excellent. Um, and we've certainly he heard that central banks it, it, it's not a question, I, I think, as you put it, Sabine, of, of why, but of how. I'm going to leave the last word on this to Thierry, who is, after all, Finance Watch. Thierry, in one sentence, what will Finance Watch be watching in this space over the next few months? Finance Watch will be watching the fact that we take action. We need to take action. This is not the time to find excuses, not to act. The world is imperfect. Um, Pierre said very rightly and was approved, I think, by everybody that financial markets are bad at pricing climate risk. I would say everybody is bad at, cli at pricing climate risk. Okay, all of us, you know, I'm no better. Okay, does that mean we do nothing? No. So Financial Watch will say, look, there's things that can be done that make sense, that will make a difference, and those things we must take action now without finding excuses. This is what Finance Watch will be doing in the coming months and years. Thank you so much, Thierry. Thank you so much, everybody. It's been absolutely super to, to hear from ECB, from Bundesbank, from Commission, just, just how kind of committed you are to this and, and how we have the, the you know, we have a starting point, as somebody said, and we're moving forward from that. And I, I think everybody um, around this, this table talking and all the, the attendees, I hope you've really enjoyed it. I've really appreciated being in this company, hearing this, the, 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 what, what people have said. And I look forward to us all being part of how we go forward with this. Um, Inspire, our, our webinar series will be continuing. It's on the website. If you manage to find this one, you will find the rest of what we're doing. 
I need to go and organize the next one, which is in macro lessons from previous crises, which I'm really looking forward to. So thank you again, everybody today. I so appreciate your time. Thank you very Have much. Have a good day. Thank you, Ronan. It was a pleasure. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Have a very Bye. nice day. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.